Hello, fellow gender and heritage enthusiasts. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to record and present this remotely. And I'm looking forward to hearing the other papers in the session. I'm Dr. Karen Dempsey. I'm a medieval archaeologist and who's interested in gender. And I'm really engaged with how we can present gender in different formats, in different ways, so that this sort of complex understanding of the past is more readily accessible for everybody. Today I want to talk with you about a workshop I did on gender and I kind of want to reflect on that process over the course of this talk. So the, the talk itself is, is going to be mainly focused on the workshop, the format, rather than the outcomes. But before um, I talk more about the workshop, I think it's good to understand where I was coming from with this project. So from 2017 to 2019, I was based in the University of Reading, where I was working on my Marie Curie, which was called Her Story. And it was about trying to offer new understandings of medieval castles without falling prey to the, the typical assumption of, of this being a man's world. And I thought by focusing on telling stories of women's lives through the things, objects they used and cared about in the spaces that they lived or worked, we would be able to have a greater understanding of the lived experience of women, but also the interplay of gender with people who were who who lived in the castle. Um, <laughs> this obviously was challenging in itself as well because castle studies, as we'll see, is quite a male-dominated discipline. It doesn't really engage with gender, and there's a there can be quite some difficulties then with accessing the material that's assumed to be male. And I think also it was that there was such an absence of women's stories in castle studies, but also there was a problematic assumption that gendered approaches are only things to do with women. As I was saying, Castle studies really is male dominated. And I don't just mean in terms of the way they think about the past, but it's also male dominated in the amount of academics who actually focus on medieval castles. That is changing, but it's certainly not changing quick enough. Of course, it's quite a niche area, I think, of medieval archaeology more generally. And its, its origins were enmeshed in military and architectural traditions of the late 19th and 20th century. And so they haven't kind of made that leap forward that is necessary for thinking about gender um, into the post-processual world. At the same time, you know, the discipline has changed and, it, you know, it embraced landscape concepts and the idea of space having meaning. But a lot of this was kind of like as in a passive reflection of power or status. And so they're kind of trapped in this ongoing debate between that sort of interpretation, which is seen as current and modern, versus the old military debates, which are seen as old fashioned. But in fact, they need to actually step outside this 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 line of thinking altogether and remember castles were full of people people are feeling and sentient beings and so on who organize themselves in terms of gender age ability sexuality whatever so there is definitely some way to go but as we'll see with the gender workshop promising. Gradual change is happening. As one part of the Marie Curie, I was going to work with Historic England and look at ways of interpreting castles from a gendered perspective. Because, and as time went on during my Marie Curie, I saw that while museum and library studies and, and other similar disciplines had explored gender in terms of the absence or representation of women. The critical reflection in these disciplines 
actually hadn't impacted heritage discourses in medieval castles. And so I really wanted to not ju not just challenge, but but understand why there was still such a concentration of warfare um, in in castles. And even though castle studies themselves had moved on from only looking at militarism, why this was the most pronounced focus at heritage interpretations of castles. Um, also to explore why the historical record is the go-to source when of course we have these wonderful upstanding structures and a wealth of material culture associated with the castles. And there's also this, this curious thing where the castles are de-peopled. So, so whatever about gender being absent, there aren't any people present. And you can see this on the, the screen to the right where images of castles just pull up these stone edifices. And so, of course, if people aren't present and people aren't thinking with things, then how can they engage with gender or sexuality? And so in my investigations <laughs> as a research as to why this sort of narrative was always present at castles. I thought maybe I could look at the heritage discourse and see was there meaningful engagement in that sense, um, from that perspective, rather than looking at it as an archaeologist who is not a, a heritage expert. But I began to see that all of the heritage um, academic literature was concentrated on conservation and restoration work or indeed how authentic a particular site could be. In other words, could the medievalness of a building be enhanced? And then another layer from a management perspective where heritage is seen as a material resource that can be graded and improved. The visitor experience is discussed, but it seems to be more like whether the tourist prefer preferred a guided tour or how close the toilets were to the to the car park or that sort of arrangement of the site. There was a little bit of engagement with reenactments and how successful they were. There wasn't really any critical discourse in relation to gender. But on the other hand, there is an understanding that castles are understood to play an important role in the cultural production of heritage. But of course, <laughs> even in that, people were still absent in the heritage interpretations. So altogether, you have this sort of um, dual narrative in both castle studies and heritage that people aren't present. So I suppose you're trying to think about who is heritage for at these sites? Who is it being curated for? And what sort of engagement are the public looking for? Are they looking for um, engagement with the military side of things? Are they interested in this sort of male gaze or is that a gender bias even at that level? So it was with the background of all of these things that I organised um, the workshop called, it was about including, challenging and changing gendered interpretations at medieval castles. And it involved a range of heritage practitioners, academics, professional archeologists, as well as um, independent researchers. And they were across a broad age range and I tried to, and career stage, and I endeavored to get a gender balance, but women outweighed men more in the, in the audience rather than as speakers. With speakers, I was able to find a gender balance. And so I was quite nervous about this um, workshop because I, while I had done extensive research and reading, I still felt that I was 
looking at heritage from a different perspective and I was really keen to get everybody talking and engaged and I will say that the people were were really wonderful. One of the key aims of the workshop was to share different interpreted approaches to gender at medieval castles and I really wanted to have as much time as possible to informal discussions because I think that's where if of course it's done in a respectful manner is where ideas and understandings really occur but I wanted it to have a frame as well and so there were six 20 minute papers on professional experiences of applying gendered approaches to the interpretation of castles. The workshop also included two breakout sessions, one of which, what makes a good and bad gendered interpretation, was really successful. And I think it really, people really opened up and engaged with, as we'll see in the next section. Some parts of the day didn't really go very well. People were tired and I tried to mitigate that by having an outside walk where we had a tour of the local medieval abbey. But I think perhaps on reflection, maybe a shorter day because it's quite an intense topic and an intense experience. Probably the most successful part of the day was the feminist retelling of the 1066, the Battle of Hastings, the invasion of, or whatever you want to call it, of um, England by the Normans. But I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. So the breakout I'm going to talk about, about what makes a good or bad gendered interpretation. So everybody was in groups and... These groups were, I, I didn't want to socially engineer them. And so people naturally drifted into maybe people that they knew and they sat at the same table. So perhaps there was like-minded people sitting in like-minded groups. Um, and But at first, using Mentimeter, which is that online voting thing where people can use their phones, I asked them to list five things individually that characterized a bad gender interpretation and a good gendered interpretation. And I got back a range of different uh, understandings from, and there, were, there was quite a bit of crossover. Then people got into groups and they wrote down, they wrote down and discussed what the results were. And you can see here on screen that the bad and good gender interpretation are pretty diverse. And I think a lot of that comes from maybe uh, the standpoint of the people who were uh, partaking in, the, in, in, in this. There was definitely a notable disparity, I think, between what constituted a good or a bad gendered interpretation. There were some great suggestions, including nuanced accounts for everyday life experiences of all people. Including women featured prominently, and some groups engaged more directly with current theoretical trends of what gender means, noting the importance of the body, the life course and cross societal approaches. It seemed that imagining what good gendered interpretations looked like proved a lot easier than discussing the bad. There was a fair difference of opinion of listing gendered interpretations as bad because they were simplistic or did not capture the extents of gender identities. Because these were viewed as a good effort and that we shouldn't actually criticise them because they're doing their best. But there was a consensus too across all groups that merely including women in a superficial way was a bad interpretation, despite the fact that most groups had defined a good gendered interpretation as including women. I think that the results demonstrated that inserting women in traditional male narratives was still regarded as a valid methodology within heritage professional perspectives. But of course, acknowledging that this approach is also problematic. And so there's this idea that gradual change, slow change is. A After the workshop, we co-wrote an article, myself, Roberta Gilchrist and three heritage practitioners, 
Jeremy Ashby, Stefan Sagrot and Samantha Stones. And we pulled out their case studies, Heritage Discourse at Castles. And this was, this was quite a rewarding experience because it brought out exactly what things we wanted to discuss, how problematic they were, and then also had particular case studies where gendered interpretations were used at Castles in a successful or not successful way. At the end of the workshop, I had organised a feminist storytelling or retelling event by Dr. Daisy Black on the Battle of Hastings. And she did a wonderful job of showing how alternative gendered interpretations can be present and can be communicated to all ages. And I think this was a real takeaway point for everybody. Thank you for listening. And please get me at Carrie Crow if you want any questions answered remotely. Thank you.